Good evening. I'm going to call to order the March 18th, 2019 City Council regular meeting. I'd like to welcome everyone for coming tonight. Uh, I'd like to ask those of you who would like to join the Council and myself in the Pledge of Allegiance to please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item on the agenda this evening is under special business. ID 0417, Sister Cities Commission Report. I'd like to invite Commission Chair Robin Kelly, Vice Chair Heather Staff, and member Sherry Gerke to come up to the podium to make the presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Commissioners. On behalf of the Sister City Commission, we come tonight to give an overview of our annual report. First, I'd like to acknowledge, sorry, there. First, I'd like to acknowledge the commissioners that do give of their time, like yourselves, um, freely in support of these efforts. We have someone from the Youth Advisory Board as well, and then um, we have the terrific support of our city clerk, Tina Eggers. The mission of the Sister City Commission, created in 2007, is, as you see in your packets, for the knowledge, goodwill, and understanding of the world through people-to-people -people diplomacy, education, cultural exchanges, economic exchanges, and humanitarian assistance. Currently, we have two sister cities, Sundal, Norway, and Chefchaouen, Morocco. To support that mission, the commission takes very strongly how unique our opportunity is representing such different countries in our own community here. And in light of recent occurrences, our Muslim community uh, feels close and we feel connected to the horrendous acts of violence and terrorism recently taken place against mosques and the Islamic culture. We have as many of you have had the opportunity, we share great relationships with these communities and with the people that come and represent their communities in our community, their countries in our country. We take great pride in that and we appreciate your support of those efforts over these years. One of our opportunities is the African region of sister cities, the Sister City International Initiatives, and that's representing our Chefchaouen, Morocco city, sister city. The sister cities invited the commission to participate on a committee regarding the African region sister cities. Commissioner Nalendo Paul is our representative. The Sister City International is expected to continue the conversation into the coming year as it prepares for the 2020 African Region Annual Conference in South Africa. Our commission looks forward to learning more and being part of that dialogue. Hello. Um, our commission is uh, partnering with One World Now, and their mission is to, de to develop the next generation of global leaders. Um, Morocco is one of their target places, and um, they seek to strengthen the connection through our sister city initiative uh, with language and leadership classes and planning a spring break trip abroad. Um, we received an uh, international award. Um, this was... Uh, through the Sister Cities International, uh, we won the award for the uh, 2018 Innovation Arts and Culture uh, segment, and um, it was the work that's uh, presented here. Um, uh, we have different um, utility boxes that are wrapped around the city, and um, this is work of Bergliot Halls, uh, and she was featured uh, two salmon days ago. So. Um, 
work from our sister cities commission has been um, published in different uh, media mentions. Uh, Issaquah Insider, City of Issaquah website and social media, the Norwegian American Issaquah Reporter, Greater Issaquah Chamber of Commerce, and of course the Sister Cities International. Uh, our very own commissioner, Mary uh, Harris, uh, was, thank you. Um, she represented us at a conference um, in Olympia in October, um, and the commission was able to have rep representation at this conference, which was fantastic. And um, she joined approximately 50 other sister city representatives from across the state. Um, and we are using some of the information that she brought back um, and are putting it into our work plan. So October 2018 was a pretty busy month for us. Um, on top of the conference in Olympia, we also had a visitor from our sister city in Shashawan, Morocco. Hamid El Hadrid um, came from Shashawan, um, and he um, is multilingual. He also, while he was here, engaged residents at the University House, at the Isqua High School, um, in dialogue and song. Um, um, while he was here, he uh, stayed in the booth, the Salmon Days booth, which was up on the steps of City Hall. Um, he performed live acoustic performances. Um, the booth featured authentic Moroccan decor. There was an interactive world map where anyone who visited Salmon Days could actually put a pin where they were originally from so we could see the depth and breadth of the connections and cross-cultural connections that we have as a community. Um, we had a create your own flag activity for the kids so they could imagine what you know their own country flags would be. Um, there were hands-on instruments to play and there were other multi-age activities, and of course, the community engaged with both Hamid and the commissioners, asking questions about the sister cities um, and the mission of the Sister Cities Commission. Um, in November of 2018, um, the commission accepted an invitation to tour Seattle's um, newly redesigned uh, Nordic Heritage Museum, um, and we were guests of the Seattle Bergen uh, Sister City Association. Um, over the last year, we've really worked uh, with that uh, commission and association to kind of uh, form a tight bond. Um, and by fostering that relationship, um, we've been able to talk about uh, new initiatives to really strengthen the Sundal relationship um, that we have. And finally, we wouldn't be a commission without the amazing support of our community, um, specifically the Arts Commission and the City of Issaquah, and of course all of the organizations and businesses that help support us throughout the year. So thank you so much to everyone for all of your support. Thank you, ladies. Um, I just wanted to take an opportunity before I say thank you to see if any of the council members have any questions or comments. I simply want to thank you for coming here this evening, sharing the story, the work that you do, uh, and to be representatives of our citizens and our city outside to others. Um, I really value that and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilmember Ray. So I, I just was a curious guy. So um, Shishawan? Mm -hmm. Shishawan. Um, so I noticed it's about the same size as this quad sport, about 40,000 people, give or take a few. I do notice that it's a bit older. Um, being founded in 1471, so, um, but, but I we hope- We learn from our elders. There you go, I hope to have an opportunity to visit it someday. <laughs> thank you, anyone else? So ladies, I just wanted to thank you for coming tonight and also be, for being such gracious hosts to me a couple of weeks ago where I could watch you in action as your commission met. Thank you for everything you do. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. The next item on our agenda this evening is audience comments. Audience, this is the time when you may address your council. The guidelines for public participation will be displayed on the overhead by Tisha. Please limit your comments to five minutes. Those who signed up will be called forward first, and if you did not sign up, I will ask for other speakers before closing this portion of the meeting. 
If you're here as part of a group and a spokesperson, please identify which group you're here for. And if you're an audience member here tonight or someone who has accompanied a speaker and you want to show the council your support while they're speaking, please raise your hand to let the council know that you're actively listening and the com you share the comments that the presenter just made. Uh, has anyone signed up to speak this evening? Yes, Tiffany Andres. Um, Tiffany Andres, 4240, 192nd Court, Southeast, Issaquah. Been a resident since 1980, property owner since 2003. Um, we bought my parents' house. <laughs> and I graduated from Issaquah High School. I teach at a local school district, so we don't quite ever leave. Um, I have been bugging, oh, hi. Um, thank you for having me tonight. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, Mayor Polly and council members, um, this is, I think, my second or third time to address you all. I have bugged you incessantly via email for eight or nine years now um, about this one project. Um, and it has been an absolute joy to work with folks like Sheldon and his predecessor, um, Gary Costa. Sheldon, I want him to be my best friend <laughs> um, and to work with certain council members. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna keep it short. The traffic is increasing. The pedestrian traffic is increasing. The bike traffic is increasing. Um, it's not getting any safer out there. The road is incredibly dangerous. Um, I am no longer a pedestrian on that road. My daughter has her driver's license. She is not allowed to drive on that road. Heaven forbid that my kid hit a biker or a pedestrian as something is going on. Um, both shoulders are incredibly dangerous. Um, we have the money. Issaquah has put money into other projects um, that I have mentioned in my emails, such as the, you know, the Bergsma property, um, things like that, where they have approved money, f much more greater amounts. Um, you, we need to do something now for this one little strip of road. Um, this is kind of our now or never time. Um, and while y'all have been amazing, the city employees are amazing. Um, those with whom I've worked on the city council have been amazing. We need to do this because what is our legacy? What is your legacy as a city council and as, as a mayor? Um, if God forbid someone gets actually hurt on that road, um, there have been three accidents that I am aware of. One last summer, I believe, where it was a bicyclist in a car. Um, earlier this winter where it was actually bicyclists, it was a Sunday morning, Saturday morning, I sprouted off a bunch of emails to you guys, sorry. Um, and it was a bunch of bicyclists, one hit a patch of ice, and they all kind of piled up on top of each other. Had there been a car in that lane, it would have been horrific. Um, and then one probably about two or three weeks ago where it was a commuter on a bicyclist who had some severe injuries, I believe, as well. Um, again, I don't know all the details, but I'm sure they're a matter of public record. Um, someone's gonna get hurt, and this is kind of our time to, uh, this is kind of a now or never time, because this is, it, you gotta do something. Um, there's, there's, on the freeway side, there's nowhere to go. Um, it's a chain link fence dividing us from cars going 60 miles an hour. I believe a car came through there probably about five or six years ago. I think it was in the middle of the night. But you can still see the, where, the spot where the chain link fence has been replaced. Um, on the other side, people cross the white line all the time. Um, so pedestrians are not safe on, this, on the other side either. Um, and I think that's it. Um, thank you for your time. Again, it has been phenomenal to work with the folks for the city. Um, best people ever, other than where I work. Anyway, thank, thank you, you, Tiffany. The project that Tiffany's referring to is a discussion council will be having later this evening on regular business under the Washington State Department of Transportation project funding request, I-90 Auxiliary Lane project and Northwest Sammamish Road. Is there anyone else signed up to speak? Yes, Steve Loper. That's gonna be a hard act to fall. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thank you also for the opportunity to talk. Um, I live at 195. 19535 Southeast 51st, so right along the parkway there. Um, been in that neighborhood for 32 years now and uh, drive that road. And also I'm an avid cyclist and, and, uh, and walker and hiker and, and 
do occasionally walk down there. Um, I wish it was a more pleasant and safe walk and ride. Um, um, just wanted to express my support as well for that for that project. Um, you know, you covered the safety aspects really well, and I, and I really don't think I can add add to that. The only thing I've noticed is that you know, in the mornings, people are using that road as a bypass road. Um, because of the freeways backing up, the people come from the plateau and they want to go to Redmond, and uh, why go uh, why, why go on the freeway which is already parked and deal with the two roundabouts when they can just zip along in our neighborhood? Um, and at the same time, you got the cyclists trying to do the similar thing. So it's it is getting more and more traffic, and uh, once the sound wall goes in, it will make it aesthetically more pleasant for people to use it. So the cycles, 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 and and walkers will will only only increase at that point. So adding more risk to the profile is not a good thing. Um, I went and looked at the the draft master plan uh, for the city of Issaquah and made a few comments on there. But I noticed a couple of things around the mobility section where this project would help address and close some gaps. One is to increase the percentage of persons that are ride sharing, cycling, walking, um, as opposed to getting in their, in their car by themselves. So this is a, something that would help uh, facilitate that. And I know the other, the other goal was to, to close the gaps in the transportation network that connects pedestrian walkways, cycling with, with, with transit. So a couple of, couple of uh, opportunities to help fulfill that, that mission within the, uh, the master plan. Um, so then lastly, I'd, I'd like to talk about, you know, um, continuity and consistency. The circle, to circle Lake Washington, or Lake Sammamish um, in a vehicle or on a, on a bicycle is, is about 22 miles. And I do this ride quite frequently in, in the good, good parts of the year. And that's this, this, little, this little missing link is the only part, less than one mile of roadway that scares the hell out of me. <laughs> and so I just wanted to get it over as fast as I can. But I think, you know, the cities of Bellevue, Sammamish, Redmond, they've all chipped in. They've all found a way to make that whole route, which is just get, becoming more and more popular with, with all the cyclists in the, in the, uh, in the area uh, to use. So if we could just close that one gap, it would be fantastic. Um, you know, when we, when we, you know, I was around when we voted on the annexation, and one of the promises I think I heard was, we're going to fix that. We're going to make that wide. We're going to put a pedestrian pathway in there. Well, that was 2006, 13 years ago. Is this about time we did something about it? That's all I got. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Appreciate Dave. It. Is there anyone else that signed up? Yes, Larry Franks. Good evening, Larry Franks. I live at 24001 Southeast 103rd Street. So I've been an Issaquah resident for 47 years so far. I'm just off of the, uh, the Hobart Road, barely outside of the city limit. Um, and I wanted to um, um, thank the, uh, the mayor and the council for the uh, opportunity to talk about our fish. I'm also representing fish, the uh, friends of Issaquah Salmon Hatchery. I believe we have some more members here in the, uh, the audience. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, I also wanted to um, uh, personally thank uh, Emily Moon for helping me um, navigate the, uh, the political waters. Um, I know how to handle fish, I know how to uh, uh, catch them, I know how to propagate them. Uh, the um, uh, government is a, a whole other dimension to, uh, to learn. Um, so I'm here to talk about City of Issaquah's number one treasure. Now I know everybody seated up there knows that that's Issaquah Creek and the salmon runs in it. Everybody in the audience, yep, lots of nodding, this is good. That treasure is imperiled, especially the um, Chinook runs. Every year, um, roughly two and a half million Chinook smolt are released. Last year we received back from that two and a half million fish, 1,800 adults. And if somebody had their phone out and did the arithmetic, that is an abysmally small number. The, um, uh, if that was a financial investment, nobody would do it. 
um, there are a number of things that are impacting those, uh, those numbers. Um, but this year, we even had to borrow eggs, almost a million eggs from other hatcheries in order to make our quota to be able to raise those um, two and a half million fish. So um, the orca might be starving, but Issaquah has a more immediate problem in terms of um, protecting the, uh, the fish coming back here. And I'm urging the, uh, the council to take decisive action before it's too late to help preserve um, this treasure. There are a number of things going on in the Washington State Legislature right now, and I just had a, another political lesson about um, uh, how we're halfway through the legislative session, and if a bill didn't make it out of committee from the originating House, it's dead. So I was going to talk about some of the bills that are out there, um, but the bigger issue is funding. So the, uh, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is still underwater, I use that term ironically, in terms of their funding. So their ability to protect our fish, to continue to propagate the fish, is limited. So I asked the council to consider working with our legislators, working with our representatives to uh, secure that funding. The uh, other funding is for Governor Inslee's um, 36 points that came out of the um, uh, ORCA task force, the ORCA recovery task force. Several of those apply directly to Issaquah. One of them is to increase Chinook salmon production, but the problem that we have is that many, many of our fish don't make it out to the saltwater, so um, we have the, the terrible return numbers. Um, the, there is funding for the, the hatcheries themselves, um, but there are many, many more things that, um, that we can do. So I'm urging um, the city and those of us in the audience to get a hold of our elected representatives. Tell them that we want to see the, uh, the funding for the projects that are going to, uh, to benefit this fish. If we don't, I fear that Issaquah um, uh, our salmon festival will become a requiem. We really don't want to see that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. <coughs> Couple of hands up in the audience. Michelle. Next we have Kelly Richardson. Good evening, my name is Kelly Richardson and I live at 14910 262nd Avenue Southeast in Issaquah. I also work for Rowley Properties. I'm here as the board president of FISH, uh, Friends of the Issaquah Salmon Hatchery. Our staff and our volunteers do a wonderful job of instilling and inspiring visitors who come here. We are the number one hatchery in the state. Uh, we're the number one educational center. We're part of the third grade education um, curriculum. And when visitors come, they experience a sense of wonder about our salmon and how they have traveled 3,000 miles to come home and they find their way home and it's, it's a miracle. We have, so we do a really a great job with education and we have more and more requests for practical environmental education in an urban environment. However, as Larry mentioned, there's a lot of concern out there. There have been a number of studies done about our fish, particularly the Muckleshoots have done studies and um, King County. And it's seen that as our fish leave Issaquah Creek, only eight to 11% actually make it to Elliott Bay. The reason is, is they've looked at there's significant predation or non-native fish are eating our fish. This has grown exponentially to the point that it is now dire for our fish. So we need to do something about the predation in these lakes, Lake Sammamish and Lake, Lake Washington. So I hope and can, can encourage you to take decisive action and to really look at what's happening um, with the predation and what we can do about it, for, about these non-native fish. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. 
Anyone else signed up, Tisha? Yes, Nancy Otelt. Hello, good evening everybody. My name is Nancy Outcalt. My address is 4568 193rd Place, and I live in uh, South Cove, that's Issaquah. And I know you all know the map, but here it is. And this is the area that I'd like to talk about tonight. So I moved into South Cove in 1995 when it was unincorporated King County. And I've, I've raised two daughters there. Uh, they're now 20 and 21. Um, but at the time, I never took them in the double stroller or bicycle down to the park or into town to go get, um, at the time, a hot chocolate at Tully's or anything or a cold drink there because it's just not safe. Um, and so while my kids are older and it's kind of beyond us to have a nice quality of life and do that, there's so many young families in South Cove and I know they all wanna use that park and go down to the area where PCC is and things. And the park is doing so many more neat things for the community. They've got the AVP, they've got the Hollifest going on, Hollyfest this weekend. So from a quality of life, it would be great to have that segment um, filled in from a quality of life. And from a safety standpoint, I know we've talked about this already, but uh, my friend, a couple doors down, she's a nurse at the UW. She works at the UW in Issaquah. She commutes to work and she's literally on garbage day been forced into garbage cans as cars are going by because there's just not enough room for a car, a garbage can, and a cyclist. And furthermore, um, as you know, Amazon is using that space at the park, and so those buses are coming down the street, so that limits it even more, and that puts another obstacle in the way for safe bicycling, safe driving, safe walking. So again, I am excited that you are even considering doing this, so thank you very much. I'm <coughs> thrilled to have this, and on behalf of all the moms who are home with their kids and doing homework and who can't be here, um, I'm here from the generation whose kids weren't able to use that, and I really hope that you'll consider putting that in place so our community you can really enjoy all the things that Esquil offers. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Anyone else? No. Is there anyone that would like to address council this evening? I see one, <laughs> four, five hands. Let's start with Dave, and next to Dave, and we'll hit you too, and then I think Steve also had his hand up. Dave, you're up. Good evening, David Kapler, 255 Southeast Andrew Street. Yes, the South Cove. They were thrilled when we got in, they got annexed. They saw police cars once in a while, and uh, we started fixing up their roads and their sidewalks, but uh, we still got a major problem to do. But it sounds like we're making progress in that. We don't have the Park Department here tonight. I wanted to rave about the great two agenda bills you have on consent agenda that they're doing at the, um, East, <coughs> most, well, the mostly the East Sunset uh, Trailhead and the chance to get appropriate trails getting up to the plateau on public property having trespassed on that property with Girl Scouts <laughs> and others and Eagle Scout and others to uh, fix that trail a little bit. Um, it'll be nice to have it done right and done in public, so thank you. Um, yes, maybe a little more blunder than previous speakers, but uh, we, we can't be putting all this money into the Issaquah Hatchery to, uh, to feed the non-native species in Lake Sammamish and other bodies of water. Um, we've got to deal with that problem. Thank you. Good Thank you. He put his hand up. Yes, you're next. Good evening, my name is Eileen Hotchkiss and my address is 4731, 193rd Place Southeast. And I also live in the South Cove area. So I would just have to reiterate what my fellow neighbors have said and I, uh, I'm very appreciative of the council's um, decision to consider moving, taking action on fixing the Westlake Sammamish Parkway, make it safer and I do wanna like I said, reiterate the safety issues, the value to the Issaquah residents that live down there to be able to feel safe and invite it to come and join the other parts of the city of Issaquah because we do feel pretty detached. Um, also, as Nancy mentioned, access to the state park, how many awesome things are happening there now, the beautiful playground, et cetera, 
so many kids want to be over there and it's not feasible for most of them unless they've got someone to put them in a car or hop on the bus with them. I'd also like to ask that you consider all of the new apartments that were just recently built in that area. There's a huge number of families in that community that I see now walking, riding bikes along that road, and I'm not sure if there's anyone here to give them a voice, but we definitely have a bigger neighborhood now, a lot more families, and I'd like to encourage <coughs> that we grow that area. So I appreciate your time and that you are considering this in the budget this year. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Um, right here. Hi, I'm Josie Beck. I live at 18724 Southeast 45th Place. And I appreciate being here today. Thank you for having me um, be able to comment. But I also want to say that I support funding for the Lake Sammamish Parkway project. I, um, I'm a resident and a property owner for the last seven years in that area. And I cycle on it three to four times a week and it's not safe. I mean, I don't feel safe on it. I've heard of accidents happening recently. The, the most recent thing that kind of happened to me when I was cycling was I was, you know, you, you have a very small shoulder and you have you know, walkers, you have runners, you have cyclists all on that. And then you have your cars. And so, you know, a lot of times I have to merge into traffic because I'm trying to avoid people or debris or garbage cans. And so, you know, I carefully look behind me because I'm like, okay, I need to merge into traffic to avoid something. And then when I look, there's a car, so I wait a little bit and then the car passes. And then I look back again and, okay, that car's kind of far behind, so I'll make my move, you know, so I'll merge into traffic and, and head up. And of course, you know, cars go faster than cyclists. So a car, you know, comes up on me, behind me, and, you know, I'm not at the top of the incline yet, doesn't see that there's a car coming in the other lane right at him because, or her, I don't know, you know, who it, who it is, but because they decide it's really important to pass me at that incline because, they're in a hurry to get to where they need to be and can't wait for me to have to, you know, to have a chance to go back into the shoulder. So everything was okay. People were able to slow down. They were able to pass me, but I don't feel like that might happen every time. There's not any room for error on this road. And, you know, Reese, like, yes, yeah, someone was injured severely last summer from our neighborhood. And then, um, a couple weeks ago, I was driving my son to school, and I see, you know, a cyclist that looks like a commuter who is on the ground in the road. Two cars that have hit each other. You know, that cyclist is looks like it's been hit by the car and waiting for the ambulance. And so, every time I see something like this or hear a story like this, I think that could have been me. I don't want it to be me. I don't want it to be my neighbor. I just really want to say that I support funding for a safer area. I support funding for a pinch point. I support funding for sidewalks, bike lanes, shoulders, whatever. I mean, it just needs to be safer. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. Do you also want to talk tonight? Come on up. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer Zhuang, um, and I live at 18716 Southeast 43rd Street in Issaquah. Um, it's in the Greenwood Point neighborhood, right in that South Lake Sammamish neighborhood also. And um, I just thought it was really important to um, let you guys know that I'm in support for the funding for the um, project, for the Pinch Point project. Um, I've been a uh, homeowner, uh, resident, um, in the neighborhood for 10 years. I've worked in Issaquah for like 20 years. Um, I drive up and down that street all the time, um, you know, four or five times a day. And um, and occasionally I'll ride my bike on it, but I'm, I'm really kind of petrified when I'm out there, so I don't really do that very often. Um, but it's really um, a shame that I, we, like my kids can't ride their bikes to like the Lake Sammamish Park. Um, and 
they would really like to. Um, and even if my kids aren't allowed to right now, there are a lot of people who are doing that. And you know, every day I'm like, you know, I'm driving down there, and it's a little scary trying to make sure I'm not running over, you know, a pedestrian or a bicyclist. And sometimes I'm driving, and the people coming the other way are swerving into my lane to avoid the other people on that side of the road, and it's just kind of scary out there. So. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak and um, for considering the project. Thank you for coming tonight, Jennifer. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to speak this evening? Steve, come on up. Hi, good evening, Mayor Pauly, City Council. Good to be here again. Um, first of all, thanks for the five minutes for audience comments, I appreciate that. Uh, Secondly, uh, wanted to give a shout out to local business Sanmar. They supported recently the United Way of King County's uh, community resource event, which is an opportunity to, for people all over King County to come together and uh, provide uh, housing opportunities and clean up and uh, resources for those who are homeless here throughout King County. It was held in Seattle that last weekend or last week, so I just wanted to shout out to local business Sanmar for that. Uh, third and final item was. Uh, Overall, it has to do with the AB 7751, not specifically, but I, I support specific ideas or items listed, but when I know when I watched the March 4th meeting, they were talking about funding mechanisms and different items being on the list. Uh, I have concerns with funding for Newport Way because for several reasons. One is it seems like as soon as we increase that or, or put that into place, we're just gonna get more pass-through traffic. The benefits for that aren't really local residents of Issaquah, I think we need to preserve our, our funding capacity for a lot of the things we've talked about in is what wanted to do, like the Sammamish Way non-motorized track bypass, and I forget the official name, but that's what we're calling it now, so I think that's a good thing uh, for the Providence Point, for the a lot of areas we've talked about having uh, connections underneath I-90 to kind of connect our city. I think that's what we need to reserve our capacity mm -hmm. for doing. Um, kind of related to that, um, I know it seems like having a, a a license plate fee might be a <coughs> regressive tax system. I would like to see if you use a car, then uh, tied to that, rather than local tax mm -hmm. district. Uh, I support the idea that it's not that I, I would like to see it not be a re regressive system, but that's more, I guess, a state legislature issue, and not a Isqua issue. Uh, I think we can still do a state tax or a sales tax and look at all the other ways we want to connect it. We want to do that and develop that system of what the things we want to develop as a whole, not just these five items that came forward, but the, what we want to do to connect all the things we've talked about and make this ideal is a quality we want to be before we do a thing that's going to support the bypass traffic because as soon as we do that again, I think the capacity will just increase for users of that system. Thank you all, I'll be least the balance of my time. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Is there anyone else who would like to address council this evening? Second call, <clears throat> anyone wishing to address council? And a third and final call. Thank you all for coming in this evening and talking with the council. We heard from a lot of you about the project that um, AB 7751, and if you are staying around or watching at home on video, Council will be discussing this item under regular business. We also heard about salmon predation and concerns that a, um, the Council takes some advocacy efforts. And a lot of items from Steve, thanking local business and also talking about audience comments at five minutes. So thank you all for coming. Uh, the next item under our agenda this evening is committee and regional reports. And we will start with Council Member Walsh. Thank you. Um, I attended the Eastside Transportation Partnership on March 8th um, at Bellevue School District offices. We heard a presentation from the Rapid Ride folks about a program update, noting that their expansion planning study will be complete in the middle of 2019, and that at this point, their current six lines um, have the potential to double with six new lines scheduled to open by 2025. None of them are in Issaquah, but there's some uh, regional opportunities there. And then we also got an, a report about the Vision 2050 update, which I'm sure we'll hear about elsewhere, but they wanted to encourage us to um, have public comment, really take a look through this. It has 
a big impact on where our regional growth is going to be, which could have a big impact on Issaquah. Um, and so they're taking public comments through April 29th at psrc.org slash vision. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Hunt. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I attended the um, pre-PIC Public Issues Committee meeting um, of the Sound Cities Association as a member of the King Conservation District Advisory Committee on March 13th. Council President Martz also attended. And um, this meeting was a presentation from uh, B. Covington, who's the director of the King Conservation District, and she was presenting information about the proposal that King Conservation District currently has for increasing the per parcel rate, which is the funding mechanism that funds all of the work that King Conservation District does. Um, this presentation will be discussed by the King Conservation District Advisory Committee at our next meeting, which it will be this week um, on March 20th, and we'll be discussing the feedback from that pre-pick meeting as well as next steps. Um, and the um, some of the information that was discussed is that Issaquah is a recipient of work from King Conservation District in terms of restoration work, as well as um, fire safety work that they're doing, and a number of other programs in the conservation space. Um, I attended the resource management meeting of Cascade Waterlands on March 14th. There was a discussion about septic systems on the waterfront in Lake Taps, which is the reservoir for um, the uh, Cascade Water Alliance, and um, discussion particularly around older neighborhoods and the need for compliance on those septic systems so that the water quality um, is safe. And we also discussed water quality monitoring plans for the Lake Taps Reservoir. And then the last item um, that we discussed was there's a proposal to waive the RCFC Regional Capital Facilities Charge for homeless shelters, and this will be decided by the board, um, of which Mayor Polly is a member, um, and I'm an alternate member. And that discussion and that decision will be made um, next week on March 27th. Mm -hmm. And that meeting is at the Cascade Water Alliance office in Bellevue. The uh, Issaquah, um, Issaquah City Council Land and Shore Committee met on March 7th, and we had two items. Um, the first one was Proposed Amendments 2018 Comprehensive Plan, Central Issaquah Plan, mm -hmm. IMC and Central Standards, and for this one there was unanimous consent, a uh, unanimous recommendation from the committee to approve um, after a number of changes had been made, and this is item C on consent this evening. And then the second item was um, AB 7683, amendments to IMC 18.07.480 community facilities standards regarding public buildings. And on this item, the, the committee had a discussion around, um, particularly around a max floor area ratio, um, which was part of the public, um, the standards for public buildings. And we had some questions that were not able to be resolved at that meeting, so it was referred back. Um, so that is on consent to be referred back to the Land and Shore Committee. The next meeting of the Land and Shore Committee will be uh, April 4th at 6.30 at Council Chambers. And then um, the Salmon Recovery Council will meet on March 21st, and I wanted to just give some information um, about our past discussions that is relevant um, currently. Uh, the, Jason mulvahill Kuntz, who's the Salmon Recovery Manager, um, uh, has a letter um, and has said that uh, Water Resource Inventory Area 8 Salmon Recovery Council is generally in support of the bill that was discussed in public comment um, today, which is H, uh, HB 1579. Um, and this is a bill that's generally to reduce populations of non-native predatory fish species that prey upon or compete with Chinook. Um, and then um, the Riot 8 Salmon Recovery Council's position is that this is a necessary step towards salmon recovery. It's not the only step. There should be a lot of other steps that are necessary, but it's a small step in the right direction. Um, and then also Salmon Recovery Council for a number of many months now has been discussing um, the concerningly low salmon returns that have been observed throughout the water resource inventory area. Uh, and just to recap, 
um, those returns for annual salmon counts of the Ballard Lock showed below average return numbers for adult Chinook, sockeye, and coho salmon representing 66%, 18%, and 48% of their long-term averages. Mm. So it's a, it's a problem that's being observed regionally. Uh, the Salmon Recovery Council will meet this week on March 21st, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Councilmember Ray. The Services and Safety Committee met on March 12th. Uh, we had four items on the agenda. Agenda Bill 7721, the 2018 ARCH Work Program and Budget. Um, in addition to reviewing the budget, we were introduced to the new ARCH Executive Manager, Lindsay Masters. Master, only singular. Um, this is coming back to the April 1st Council meeting on consent with a recommendation to approve. We heard two agenda bills related to East Tiger Mountain that I think we heard about during public comment today. Agenda Bill 7739, amendment to the interlocal agreement with the Department of Natural Resources for the maintenance and use of High Point Trailhead regarding property acquisition and maintenance fees. I've asked Jeff to shorten his AB names. Noted. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also Agenda Bill 7740, Puget Sound Energy Recreational Use Agreement and Permit for Limited Use of Operation Property Permits. Both of these are uh, trailhead easements that, as we heard earlier today, um, will just legitimize some of the um, access that people have. Also part of this is a land acquisition by the Department of Natural Resources in which the city of Issaquah is a funding partner. Those are coming back, uh, those are on today's um, consent agenda as items E and F. We also heard agenda bill 7723, um, cemetery fee increase amending IMC 2.20.040. The committee uh, recommended unanimously to postpone this uh, agenda bill indefinitely. Um, after we dug into this a bit, it became apparent that the Parks Department is looking at the long-term plans for the um, hillside cemeteries, and this is an issue that would be better taken up when those plans are put together. So we're, we're putting this one uh, postponed indefinitely. Um, the next meeting of Services and Safety Committee is April 9th at 6.30 here in Council Chambers, and that concludes my report this evening. Thank you. Council Member Winterstein. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A first report on the Puget Sound Regional Council's Growth Management Policy Board. We met back on March 7th at PSRC headquarters in Seattle. Um, a number of items were on the agenda. Of course, as was mentioned earlier, the focus of this group is on the update to do it to create Vision 2050. It's a vision for uh, as we grow and receive perhaps 1.3 or more million more people between now and 2050, um, how are we going to do that? And, and this, is, this is a guiding document that will affect the comprehensive plans of everybody who does GMA-based planning uh, in the four-county region. Um, and we, start, we talked at length about some potential changes for there's an existing Vision 2040. It's got different sections in it. There's one called an environmental section. And the PSRC staff at this point has proposed some updates and changes to existing policy statements and is proposing some new policy statements. So we kicked off our conversation, um, and the, this was just the beginning uh, of that, uh, for the environment section, on the development pattern section, and on the section on economy and jobs. So some Q&A about, again, the proposed policy changes. We then did a breakout on economy and jobs. And um, my takeaway from that conversation and then the debriefs we had afterwards is um, it's difficult for a planning organization to feel they have a lot of control over what happens with jobs. A lot of desires and everybody wants the same balance that we do. Um, planning organizations, I think, have a difficult job of really driving what the economy generally drives. Um, and so that was just more of an editorial comment. We spent a lot of our time, too. The beginning of the meeting, we did get a review, <clears throat> presented the draft supplemental EIS. Thank you, Lindsay, for mentioning that earlier. It is available for review, and they're taking comments uh, through the end of April. I would make a request of staff. I know that we have a, a news page, we have a page on our own website where our communications department has mentioned um, this draft EIS and that they're open for comments. And um, I have some suggested updates to that. It does take you to the PSRC page. 
but they're also from our meeting minutes from last, from, from March 7th, some really good presentation material that succinctly presents the, the draft supplemental EIS. And I think you can review that in a matter of minutes and get the core of what is being proposed there um, as opposed to the full document yourself. So I think it would help anybody who's interested in getting that shortcut. And I can help point that out to you. I found it very helpful. But the core, there's three alternatives discussed in the, uh, in, in the EIS. One is called stay the course, which is also known as the do nothing option, which is, means to continue to uh, manage growth and uh, as we currently are, which is um, to drive most of that into our largest cities and regional growth centers and less into rural areas. We looked at the option of encouraging even more focused growth around transit centers. Uh, so it's, it's still focusing growth long term um, in growth centers around cities, but even higher densities around the huge public investment that this region is making in our transportation infrastructure. And then the third uh, option was to maybe reset some criteria and allow growth, growth to be more dispersed throughout the region. Now it's not a complete apocalyptic vision. It's a very minor adjustment, enough that you can measure, and I think the presentation I talked about that we got does a good job of summarizing the three alternatives in about five or six different ways and how they, um, how they compare to one another on key, on key measures. Um, and um, so, so those are the, we were introduced to that. We're gonna be continuing to discuss that after the public comment period is over. Um, we have a couple months scheduled uh, for, um, for further review by the PSRC GMPB. And our next meeting is at the first Thursday of April and that agenda hasn't been set yet. Next, uh, the Council Infrastructure Meeting will meet, Council Infrastructure Committee will meet this Thursday, March 21st. There are three items on the agenda. Uh, the first one is, guess what? We get to talk about wireless communications again. And I believe you, you've got a sub for that. Okay, thank you. Thanks for handling that. Uh, but we're only gonna talk about one aspect of wireless communications, and that's gonna be the question of public notification for level one reviews. So anybody's interested in that, that material is in the packet. We're also gonna get a report from Jeff Watling, uh, a facilities report uh, concerning, um, and I have some material right here. Uh, I think this is the beginning of a year long conversation about uh, potential, uh, a, a policy question about um, um, city hall facilities long term, what, what's the right thing for Issaquah? And so there is no agenda bill yet, but I'm gonna, Jeff, if you're listening, I'm gonna echo Chris's re response when this turns into agenda bill. Please keep the, no the name short. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, and the last item we're gonna, is just gonna be the weekly normal project status updates. So that's the, agenda, that's the meeting this Thursday. It'll be here at 6.30, cha chamber, um, chamber hall here at 6.30 this Thursday. That concludes my report, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Goodman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Eastside Fire and Rescue Board of Directors met uh, last Thursday, March 14th. Um, had a couple of uh, good news items in particular uh, to report that, that stood out. The first is um, that Eastside Fire um, is receiving an award from um, through the Washington Employer Support of the Guard and Reserves for providing outstanding employer support to men and women of the National Guard and Reserve components this direct relate um, directly relates to how Eastside Fire and Rescue um, uh, treats their uh, men and women em employees who serve in the military. And the chief will be uh, attending the banquet and accepting that award on behalf of the um, organization. And then we also heard, um, we saw a presentation about a, an interesting uh, new program that Eastside Fire and Rescue will be rolling out in a couple of week weeks. It's called Community Connect. And it is um, a program um, that you can opt into that um, allows residents to share important and critical information with first responders. Um, and so very simply and basically how it works is through East, Eastside Fire and Rescue's website. You can sign up and create an account and provide information about your home um, that it's particular to your home that first responders, uh, you might want first responders to know about when they show up at your house for an emergency. Um, information about pets and um, maybe if there are um, elderly people there or people with, with needs. Um, it's just, this is a, exciting because it's a, a newer program around the United States and only a few departments are using it right now. So that is going to be rolled out in a couple of weeks and 
uh, we asked, um, Councilmember Ray and I are on the board, and we asked for a, uh, there to be a presentation um, at an upcoming council meeting because those are televised, and we thought it might help reach uh, many more people in our community. And next meeting is, oh, when is it usually? Oh, I guess the second Thursday. Um, anyway, I'll re <laughs> I can announce that next, what? April 11th. April 11th, thank you. Um, and of course, there's not an agenda that's been set yet, and that's my report, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Council President Batiste. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, no report tonight, just a quick announcement that the next Eastside Human Services Forum board meeting will be April 18th in Bellevue, and uh, the agenda has not been announced yet. Thank you. Council President Martz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a couple things right now and then a couple things for good of the order. Uh, Sound Cities Association met uh, last Wednesday, March 13th, as uh, Councilmember Hunt mentioned, the pre-pick was on KCD. Um, she mentioned um, the parcel fee, uh, the proposed changes. It's a it's a fairly small number. It's, it's ten or eleven dollars roughly per parcel uh, currently, but it would be a thirty or forty percent increase. So they're they're looking to um, discuss what they would do uh, with with that proposed increase. I was very happy to hear that one of the pilots that they're working on right now is a Firewise program for Issaquah, and Firewise is something that um, I had seen over on the dry side over in Kittitas and Chelan counties, and it's really around uh, this issue of of urban wildland interface fires and trying to reduce Issaquah's risk for wildland urban interface fires. And these are the types of fires that they had in Wenatchee where the uh, forest burnt to the edge of the city and then did some damage to the city of Wenatchee. So um, very excited about that. Uh, a couple of discussion items that I'm, I'm going to ask you all about a little bit further in uh, for the good of the order. Um, the Challenge Seattle Middle Income Housing Initiative uh, want to chat about that a little bit, and then Initiative 976, uh, which is the latest Tim Iman initiative. Um, I'm being asked to, uh, all of us were being asked to go back to our cities and talk a little bit about it, so you'll hear more about that. Uh, growth management planning council, policy council, uh, is, will be meeting on Wednesday, March 27th at 4 p.m. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Affordable Housing Committee membership. This is AKA the Balducci uh, uh, initiative and there will be SCA appointments to that body. So um, SCA is expecting to send out a call for nominations in the coming days and we'll appoint through the usual process uh, recommendations by nominating committee uh, considered for pick on April 10th and final appointment by the SCA board on April 17th. Uh, so look, keep an eye out for that if you're potentially interested in that. Um, affordable housing supplemental materials. Uh, this is around, um, with all that's going on around affordable and low income housing, there was a qu request for uh, SCA staff have talked, uh, sorry, a request for a reference guide that would help policy ma policymakers navigate this complicated and layered na landscape. So if, as soon as we get that, I will share that. And then the third thing uh, that uh, we will be talking about is uh, Vision 2050. And as Paul mentioned, there's a draft EIS out. And I think that um, the mayor wanted to talk a little bit in go to the order about um, the mechanisms by which we can get feedback in for that draft EIS. Um, and then, oh, that's it. That's it. Yeah. That concludes my report. Thank you. Um, on the mayor's report this evening, uh, an executive session was held at 5.45 p.m. There was a special meeting to discuss minimum price at which real estate will be offered for sale or lease for RCW 42.30.110 per N1 per NC and pending potential litigation per RCW 42.30.110 per N1 per NI. No action will be taken this evening in open session. I want to give you a little bit of an update on the Bergsma property acquisition, something we've been talking about for over a year. We officially closed on the Bergsma property as of Thursday, February 28th. This is the first significant step in a two-step process. As you may remember, the City Council authorized the administration to purchase the property and to pursue some very significant grant funding. 
Our first significant grant application has been submitted. Earlier this month, we submitted a grant for conservation future grant funds through King County, and we expect to hear news on whether we awarded are awarded a grant or not by July. And this was a really important part of Council's approval was that we uh, seek out these significant grant opportunities. Also wanted to provide an update on a project in central Issaquah called the Vale Housing Project. Vale is an apartment complex currently under construction on 7th Avenue Northwest near the Safeway on Gilman. It is located in central Issaquah. As part of allowing additional height on some projects, the city requires at least 10% of the available units to be affordable. Vale apartments are now leasing, with occupancy starting around May 1st. The development features 110 apartments with 10% or 11 units designated for affordable housing. As an example of what this can mean in our community, a single person with an income around $38,000 could lease a studio unit apartment for $935 per month. Another example is a family of three with a combined income around $43,000 could lease a two bedroom apartment for approximately $1,200 a month. These are not the exact numbers, but they give a general idea of the income requirements and cost units. If you are interested in learning more about this complex, you can visit the developer's website at www.liveatvale.com. The management company for Vail will also accept applications for the units designated for affordable housing. If you're interested in other affordable housing opportunities in our area, please visit www.archhousing.com. ARCH, a re regional coalition for housing, is the city's affordable housing management program and maintains a list of people who would like to purchase or lease housing for the east side. If you think you might qualify for affordable housing, I strongly recommend contacting ARCH to get on their list so you can be notified when properties become available. I can't remember if uh, Council Member Goodman mentioned the Eastside Fire and Rescue Fireground 101, but I wanted mm. to. Uh, Eastside Fire and Rescue and the local union 2878 is holding their Fireground 101 event next month. This is a special event designed for elected officials to experience a day in the life of a firefighter. I participated in this event in 2016, and it was a great experience, <clears throat> a lot of fun, and I encourage our council members to take advantage of this opportunity. It is Saturday, April 2017, 2019. Goes from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Next door at Bellevue's Training Center. Mountains of Sound, Greenway designated National Heritage Area. After eight years of advocacy from local nonprofits, citizens, businesses, politicians, and government agencies, Mountains of Sound Greenway has become our nation's newest National Heritage Area designation. The first in the Pacific Northwest, Mountains of Sound Greenway joins the company of 54 other National Heritage Area sites in 32 states, like New York's Niagara Falls and Mississippi's Gulf Course, uh, Coast. Designation as a National Heritage Area requires an act of Congress. The Greenway National Heritage Area mm. legislation was originally introduced in 2013 and had bipartisan support by U.S. Representatives Dave Reichert and Adam Smith and Senators Maria Cantwell and Patty Murray. This is quite an achievement. This is one of our significant partners in town as the Greenway passes through Issaquah. And so we want to offer them thanks and congratulations to everybody who was involved in this effort. And for good of the order, I've also been tracking a couple of items with um, Council President Martz. And the other one I wanted to add is, as you've heard through audience comments this evening, the Friends of the Isquah Salmon Hatchery is requesting support of HB 1579, supporting salmon recovery. And we will discuss this during the good of the order this evening. We will be asking for your thoughts concerning Fish's request. And that concludes my report. So we'll be proceeding to the consent calendar, which was distributed to council in advance. If authorized, the items on the consent calendar will be considered together and approved by one motion. Have the payables and payroll been reviewed? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Does any council member desire to remove any item from the consent calendar and consider it under regular business? Is there a motion? Madam Mayor, I move we adopt the consent calendar as listed in this evening's published agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor, favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you, that carries unanimously. The next item under our agenda this evening is regular business. 
AB 7751, Washington State Department of Transportation Project Funding Request, I-90 Auxiliary Lane Project, Northwest Sammamish Road. That's an awfully long AB name as well, by the way. <laughs> this item was referenced in the Ad Hoc Long-Term Finance Committee's recommendation for Transportation Capital Project Funding, AB 7050, which was presented and discussed at the March 4th Council meeting. I'd like to invite Public Works Engineering Director Sheldon Lynn to make a presentation. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, as introduced, this is Agenda Bill 7751, and sorry, I'm Sheldon Lynn, Public Works Engineering Director. Uh, you heard a lot from the community uh, during audience comments. What I'm gonna do is give a brief introduction, specifically policy question for you. I'm gonna go through the background of the issues, and then I'm gonna go through Washington State Department of Transportation's request of the city, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the principles of the draft agreement, and then I'm gonna presentation that's in the agenda bill. The policy question that's in front of the City Council tonight with regard to this agenda bill is, should the city commit to funding up to $3 million towards an I-90 auxiliary lane project in return for receiving a retaining wall and widened right away for Northwest Sammamish Road, which will allow the city to construct its non-motorized project in the future? The area specifically we're talking about with this agenda bill is shown as the constrained area uh, in the red uh, along Northwest Sammamish Road. This area extends for roughly 1,200 lineal feet from approximately Southeast 51st to the address of 5220 Northwest Sammamish Road. The work that's proposed in this area will facilitate and is integral to the future and larger South Cove non-motorized connectivity project recommended by the Ad Hoc Finance Committee uh, at the March 4 meeting This uh, that was just held. The construction of the city's future non-motorized project, however, is subject to the current funding conversations that the city council is having and is not included in this $3 million that is uh, being asked from WashDOT. The situation along Northwest Sammamish Road, you may recall this graphic from the presentation on March 4th, is a highly constrained area, narrow shoulders, steep driveways to the north with homes to the north. If the city were to widen to the north, we would impact the residences and likely have to t uh, acquire a couple of them in their lakefront properties. The other option was to widen to the south, which is I-90 limited access, hence, that brings in WashDOT to the equation. Knowing what the city is up against for this section, the city requested from WashDOT to provide the widening to the south with their auxiliary lane project. This graphic shows what WashDOT has agreed to do and incorporate within the design of the auxiliary lane project. Currently, the graphic shows two lanes of traffic an existing retaining wall, and then what's shown here is a future noise wall slash retaining wall. When WashDOT is complete with the work, essentially what goes away is the current re small retaining wall and the existing fill material behind it, leaving the future noise wall and retaining wall. This provides the space for the city to come in at a later date with its project to widen Northwest Sammamish Road through this area for non-motorized facilities. This is a rendering of what the area would look like once WashDOT completes the work. It'll have the wall, a gravel shoulder, and then it'll show the existing pavement as it is today. Again, this facilitates and is integral to the city's future project the future project is not incorporated within this $3 million. WashDOT's request. WashDOT's request is a function of a number of things. First, the Connecting Washington project by which funds this project has restrictions on it. If the bid is above the maximum available budget, the bids are automatically rejected. Hence, the opportunity for building the wall and so forth goes away. 
The engineer's estimate currently is near the maximum available budget. Uh, uncertainties that WashDOT is facing is the bid climate. Uh, they're seeing the bids coming in 10 to 40 percent over the engineer's estimate and there's very little contingency within their budget. Hence, WashDOT, in an effort to increase the maximum available, has requested $3 million from the city of Issaquah to help ensure that the bids will come within the budget allowed. There's no guarantees, but it's an opportunity to increase the ability to have this occur. There was a question at the last meeting about uh, what the actual history of the bids are that WashDOT's been receiving. What's shown on the screen is in February of this year, statewide average, WashDOT was seeing bids on average 14% above the engineer's estimate. In the Northwest region, which this project bids, there were, there were two projects that were advertised and they're 36 and 32% above the engineer's estimate. In January, the state average was 3% above, and in the Northwest region, 4% above. I'm not gonna just read each one. I think you guys can get the message here. Uh, some patterns in here that I've noticed in the estimates and the bids. A lot of the estimates that are, when the bids came in substantially above the engineer's estimate for the Northwest region, the engineer's estimates were on the order of seven to $15 million. Relatively smaller project, but when you have a small increase in that, it results in a higher percentage. So there, there's some hope uh, that we could still pull this off and bring it in under budget and within the amount allowed uh, with the city's $3 million. The agreement. The agreement that WashDOT has negotiated with the city provides the city with paying up to $3 million due at the end of the project, their project. WashDOT would deed the right-of-way to the city, and WashDOT would construct the wall and widen the right-of-way, as I previously had described. And the city's payment is in consideration of WashDOT constructing the retaining wall. The recommendation from the administration is to authorize the execution of the interagency agreement obligating the city to contribute up to $3 million towards the auxiliary lane project. I can answer sorry, questions if can, you'd like. Can, can, you, can you go back a second? You said the, in, can you explain the in consideration of statement that you just made, just in case anybody doesn't understand what that this is? This last one, yeah. in consideration. Essentially, that's the value that the city is going to get. We're not gonna pay any money unless we get a wall. Okay, that was the important bit, thanks. <clears throat> At the end of the presentation? It is, Madam Mayor. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sure, we'll have questions. Who would like to start? Council Member Goodman? Thank you. Um, can you go back one slide again? You bet. So the, um, so help me understand this a little bit. So um, the retain, there's a retaining wall and there's a sound wall. Yes. Um, would either of those walls be built as part of this project if we weren't, if we were not seeking wider right of way? The sound wall would be, and the engineer's estimate that is included in the, I forget which exhibit it is to the agreement, uh, shows what the estimate of increase in cost would be for that sound wall to be able to construct it as a retaining wall and to do the work that the city's requested. And that's roughly about $6 million of money that would not be in the engineer's estimate if they weren't doing the work for Issaquah. So are you saying that the engineer's estimate to, to build the part, sorry, I'm confused. The engineer's estimate yep. to build only that portion which the city has requested. The retaining wall. The retaining wall and removal of the fill material $6 that's existing dollars. is approximately $6 million. The, um, the agreement 
talks about um, the, the agreement states that the city would have to pay overages at the end of the project based on just an invoice that the city gets. And the invoice amount would be overruns for even non-wall related elements of the corridor project. That could be, yes. Because the wall is going to be probably one of the first things built. And so it's hard to know where they end up towards the end of the project. But if they build the wall, they may come up short because it's a $6 million wall. They may come up short for their project. And so they're basically saying, look, we're taking a risk and we'd like you to agree to pay $3 million in consideration for us building the wall if they need the money later in the project. If they don't need the money later in the project, then we won't pay any money. So it's between zero and $3 million that the city would be obligating. And what if it's not the wall that pushes? If it's not the wall that pushes it, okay, let's use this as an example. They build the wall and everything's going smoothly, but then they're drilling piling for other sound walls and they run into difficulties. The $6 million that they would have spent, that they spent on our wall, they could have used to offset the increases cost for the other work that they said, oops, we had an unforeseen condition now. So they're spending money up front for us and they're asking us to help them later in the project if they need it, up to $3 million. Okay. Um. Yeah, that's all I have for now, thanks. Okay, uh, Council Member Winterstein. Thank you. Uh, following that line of question, so it's, ac is this accurate? Um, every project has an estimate and that includes uh, some contingency amount. And our $3 million is just going, would go into, or whatever amount we potentially approve this evening, would go into the overall project budget increasing the amount of contingency available for the entire project? It would increase the amount of funding available for the project. When the bids come in, WashDOT will know exactly what their contingency is available at that point in time. Right, all right, all right. So, and, and thank you for that. Then what is the engineer's estimate for this entire project? For the entire project, including all the soft costs and everything? The engineer's estimate, I hear that as a single number, so I assume it's, there's it's only one. It's 71.4 million, I believe. Do you know what the total amount available is without any city contribution? You mentioned that earlier, how the engineer's estimate is getting close to the total amount available. Okay, so two separate questions you're asking. Um, to clarify, the total amount available for the construction contract is like 50.5 million out of the total project budget of roughly 71.4. So your three million is going towards the total available, it's adding to the total available for construction and work associated with construction only. So Actually, oh, okay, okay, is there more? No, go ahead. Oh, I'm just keying off what you said earlier. You said that the engineer's estimate is getting close to the total amount available. Uh, yes. Just trying to, you mentioned earlier about how some of those percentages for $7 million yeah. projects over by a couple million, that's 30%. Yeah. Just give me the numbers here we're talking about. Like okay, what's engineer's so, estimate so, and so what's the total when, bill? When I presented to you engineer's estimate versus actual bids, those were construction cost estimates okay. versus what they got the bid on the construction contracts. That wasn't total project budget. When WashDOT does their calculations for the maximum available amount for construction, mm -hmm. they subtract out all this other soft costs and things like that, design, right away, whatever they had to do, and then they have a certain amount available for con the construction contract. That's the maximum available amount that they have calculated because they need this other amount for construction engineering, testing services, and the like, as well as they set aside some money for unforeseen conditions during construction. Contingency. Contingency. So they have an engineer's estimate 
of I believe 50.5 million for the construction contract and that is the maximum available amount that they have. So the three million is gonna roughly increase the uh, amount available for the construction contract by roughly 5%. Okay, okay, so just to make sure I'm understanding this then, the engineer's estimate you were referring to earlier is just the construction estimate, it's not the overall project. That's correct. And that number is 50 and change, you mentioned yes. what that is. Okay, and when you say they're near the total amount available for the project, uh, that's that 50 plus those other costs. Correct. Which the whole project is at 71 and change. Correct. Um, so this, but this is not, okay, so, so our contribution would go to the line which is construction only. Correct. Construction, construction engineering, well, testing. Oh, okay, all right. All that. Okay, and then, uh, and I had the advantage of being in the ad hoc committee, so I heard this, and I just want to make sure for everybody's mm -hmm. understanding as well. Uh, the reason this is, um, because of the law, you cited that one, the, this project, Connecting Washington, it's you get the bids under the allotment, uh, and you can do a project. If no bids come in, the project has to be reformulated. Correct. And we were told that if, this, if no bids come in underneath the amount of funding available, then uh, they would re potentially reformulate the project and this retaining, uh, this sound wall that is in this proximity of the pinch point would be like one of the first features that they would eliminate to, to scope down the project so they could rebid it. Yes. And if they eliminate that, we don't get any of the work and the benefit that we're talking about. That's correct. Okay, and however, um, uh, whether it's the current budget or their current budget plus some amount that maybe we wanna kick in, um, if a bid comes in lower than that amount, uh, and especially with our agreement, if we do have one, then we will get this work done that we're seeking here. Yes. And that, that could happen even if we didn't put an extra three million in. They, they could go out without our money. That's 71 correct. 71 total, uh, if a one bid comes in under it, we would still get the wall. That's correct. So, so what we're doing here is we are adding to the contingency on this project to help assure that, that maybe one project will come in, at least one bid will come in, I should say, uh, below the estimate. Below the money available, that's correct. Okay, all right, and I just wanted to make that clear. This is actually one of the things that makes this difficult for me. As, as some of you know, it's like, I mean, this is, getting this done has been, I, I really appreciated former council member standing up and, and uh, one of the ones that was involved with the annexation when it happened many years ago, I appreciated that very much. And since I've been sitting in this chair, trying to get something done about this project has been pretty important. So this is what, but this idea that we could still get all this and not spend it or commit a dollar today. We could still get this. Potentially. It's not contingent, it's right, it's not contingent. It's, it's not a yes, we get the project or not. So that is what your answers to my questions are just helping make mm -hmm. clear. I want everybody to understand that we could potentially do nothing and still get this work done by WashDOT. Um, okay, thank you. So we are in questions, so I wanna make sure I give all seven of you an opportunity. Oh. Jump, hands jumped up. Councilmember Ray, Councilmember Hunt. So if we um, agree to the $3 million and the bids come in and there is a bid that's less than the available funding, what happens to the $3 million? The $3 million remains committed and towards the end of the project, if everything has gone smooth, you know, you'll use a portion or none of that $3 million. So if, um, so if we commit the $3 million and the bids come in at less than what is uh, available, then our $3 million goes into a contingency to cover um, overruns. Yes. And if we don't commit the $3 million and the bids come in less than the available funding, um, what's the What's the protocol for overruns then? If the bids don't come in under no, what wash we a, Let's say we get a bid in for less than the available funds. Okay, so less than the available funds, if it's, okay, so there's two pots of available money, right? Mm -hmm. There's city three plus, this, plus the states. Mm -hmm. If it's under the cumulative between the two of them, let's say it's somewhere in between, you know, adding them together, then 
a portion of your three million dollars would certainly be used. If well, it's that's the question. If no, it's, uh, it, uh, I'm not, I'm not tracking. Was it so. if the council does not elect to yes. put forward the guarantee of three million, and the bid prices come in, Under whatever the they funding. do, oh, but then okay. there's an overage, then exactly. what happens? Exactly. That's that's my question. What, so we're we're not oh. uh, we elect not to um, fund this. The bids come in at a level that is under the current budget up for the for Washington. Oh, I see. And then there are unforeseen okay. things with the uh, whatevers. Okay, what I, I misunderstood the question. Thank you for clarifying, Mayor Polly. Uh, if the city does not commit the three million dollars, and the bids come in under the WashDOT available funding. WashDOT will build the project, no cost to the city, and there's nothing that the city has committed to for funding. And that project would include the And the annual. project would move forward as it's designed and as shown in the, that includes the wall. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, actually just, I thought it went a little further. I thought the question was, and then if there were overruns, how would they be funded? If there are overruns? No WashDOT would though. WashDOT would have to go if no bids came in within the available funding, WashDOT would go back and repencil no, no, no. the project. I think that I, thought, I think that was my question. There might be another one, but my, my you know my question is: Is there any coming back to the city after the fact? So you know, so that we get the retaining wall. And not not if the uh, city doesn't execute the th the agreement. In the agreement, there are, there is a term in there that says that if the bids if all the bids come in over the available money including the city money, mm -hmm. WashDOT will have to go back and re-pencil the project, but in doing so, they will come back and have another conversation with the city about this segment of the project. So it would probably afford the city another opportunity to look at what's available financially. And then, can I do one more follow-up? And without building this retaining wall, then we are really precluded from doing Realistically addressing the issues around the constriction point there on, um, is it Northwest Sammamish or is it Southeast Sammamish Parkway? It looks like it's right in the middle. Yeah, realistically, you, you've now taken away your opportunity unless you're going to use eminent domain for the properties to the north. Okay, thanks, Sheldon. Councilmember Hunt, then uh, Deputy Council President Batiste. Um, I think you partly addressed this, but I'm going to ask just to clarify it. So under the, um, under the, um, it is mutually agreed as follows part of the, um, of the agreement. Um, it talks about if the pro if the, um, if bids for the quarter projects construction are certified to exceed the sum of the project's cost estimate plus the three million, then they will withdraw the advertisement and repackage. So that it doesn't necessarily mean in that case that the opportunity is gone. It we would have to go back, but it sounds like we have to go back to the drawing table. Is that right? That's correct. Under the connecting Washington, they have to repackage and uh, rescope the project. Okay. But in doing so, they do say in section 1.4 that they will coordinate with the city concerning the retaining wall construction during the repackaging. So they, they would intend to come back to the city and talk about they, they would come back and we'd have conversations about funding again. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, and then just a follow-up to Councilmember Ray's question. If, if they, um, if the, Bids come in, regardless of what the bids come in, they can use the $3 million if we agree to put forward the $3 million for overages on other parts of the project. That is correct. And if we didn't put forward the money, um, the retaining wall is one of the first parts of the project that would be built, so they probably would not cut that part of the project out. Is that correct? If it's built, they wouldn't be able to cut it out, but what they would be faced with is, is looking what's left in the project and they'd have to start cutting the rest of the project. Uh, one example may be that they haven't done the paving of the main line yet as part of the project, and that's the only thing left on the scope, and so they may have to cut the paving of the I-90 main line. So there's some, you know, it's, every piece of the project is critical to its success, and so they've basically said, look, we're putting in $6 million extra 
you know, to build this facility and they want to have some help from the city to make sure that the entire project still gets built. Okay, and the, the cap on the overages that the city would be required to pay is the three million. It's three million dollars, that that's correct. Cost one higher. And if they still end up with the same issues at the end of the day, they still have to figure out how to repackage the project during construction and what's left of the project to come within the budget that's available. Thank you. Deputy Council President Patisse. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Sheldon, could you go back to the engineering estimate um, overrun slide? This one? Yeah. So the, I was just, I know you spoke a little bit about maybe smaller projects and then you see the percentages um, being much higher, but I, I was just wondering if you could speak to the difference between January and February um, and the increases in the, um, especially in the Northwest region. For one moment, let me pull up my notes. Okay. So the two projects in February of 19, the engineer's estimates for one of the projects was 2.1 million. <laughs> it was for work up at the pass, Hayek to Stampede Pass. Uh, the bid came in, the low bid came in at 2.8 million, resulting in a 32% overrun. That's not a lot of difference when you look at the absolute value of the money, but it's a high percentage of the engineer's estimate. It's a $700,000 overrun. The other one was for a larger project from North, uh, northbound Seneca Street to SR 520 for mobility improvements, and the engineer's estimate was 16.5 million. I'm rounding off. The low bid came in at 22.38 million, 36% over. Again, these projects, these two projects were 20% or less of the engineer's estimate that we have for this project at 50. Uh, so the smaller amounts for the overruns resulted in higher percentages uh, related to the engineer's estimate. In January, there was only one project in the Northwest region that was actually advertised for bidding, and that was for paving uh, between Bickford to Gold Bar along Highway 2. Uh, or is that Highway 20, I guess. Engineer's estimate was 11.4 million. The low bid came in at 11.9 million. Again, not a whole lot of difference in the absolute value of the price, but that was uh, a 4% over engineer's estimate. Okay, thank you. Does I that help you? I'm trying to better understand. Yep, it does. And, and when you were talking about um, if you had to go, they had to go back to the drawing board, if they had to repackage, it, do you have any idea on timeline around that? It's a delay of at least 12 months. 12 months. At least. Thank you. Thanks. Councilmember Hunt, or Walsh, and then I'll <laughs> come to Council President Martz. Thank you. Sheldon, are there any situations, I, I, my understanding is the difference between bid and engineer's estimate being above is a relatively new situation that we're dealing with. Is that correct? I. In this economy, as it's been picking up uh, over the past few years and so forth, it's been more more common than not, okay. uh, and it's more common over in this area than there than it is on the eastern part of the state. Have there been other situations where cities have been asked to contribute in order to make sure that the available dollars? Um, are closer to what they might see on a bid situation? I'm not aware of other cities asking WashDOT to incorporate work on their behalf into the project. Okay. So I'm not prepared to answer that question. Okay. Thank you. Let's play the Mertz. Did you have any questions? No. Um, thank you. I, I had, was going to look at City Administrator Moon and our attorney to yeah. see if there are any aspects of the agreement that you think need to have some additional commentary? I just asked Sheldon to maybe speak to uh, the risk that might be associated with WashDOT pursuing the project without this agreement with the city 
and that risk as it relates to the conveyance of right of way. Uh, since the agreement specifies that WashDOT will process that conveyance of right of way due to our participation. So what happens to that aspect of our project if we don't participate in this agreement? Could you say what section that is you're reading from? 3.1. Thank you. I appreciate the prompt. <laughs> I know Jim was trying to get my attention, but I couldn't quite read his lips. Uh, so the risk of right-of-way dedication, uh, as Ms. Moon spoke, WashDOT is processing our request for them to deed over the right-of-way through the FHWA, Federal Highway Administration. That is a component within this agreement. If we don't move forward with this agreement, uh, there's no specific agreement that WashDOT would continue that processing. Uh, so the risk is relatively low that they wouldn't process it. But if they're in a place where they have to go back and uh, retool the project uh, because bids came in too high, the ability for us to get the right away from FHWA and WashDOT would be diminished. Uh, so if, if they build the wall, without the agreement, I think we'd be able to still continue and get the right away from WashDOT uh, because they verbally told us they'll do it for us. But we wanted to put this in the agreement to make sure that if they build the wall, they're still going to give us the right away to use, use it because we didn't want to put three million without having the ability to use that right away. So the risk is there, but uh, if we don't participate and they don't end up building the wall. And uh, one, one more element of risk, total transparency here on this, and I appreciated the prompt, I really did, uh, is that this agreement, the transference of the right of way and ability to use it is still subject to Federal Highway Administration approval. Uh, I know that WashDOT staff has had many conversations with FHWA thus far about this, and there are no issues. They're just moving forward with the paper process, but the decision has not yet been made. So there's a little bit of risk there, but high confidence that the risk is next to nothing on getting the right-of-way use ability. That's just the clarification. Are there any additional questions? We've been through everybody once, and we, Council Member Goodman? Uh, I'm not, I think we've chewed around the edges here, but I'm not sure we've actually answered this question. So if the city does not commit $3 million and the bids come in too high and they repackage, there's the delay. Um, yes. But I'm wondering during that repackaging, is there a risk that WashDOT will just um, repackaging might involve no wall and right of way in order. There's a substantial risk to that. Yeah. And there's no place of agreement between the two agencies that would ask WashDOT to come back and even revisit it with Issaquah to see if we'd be willing to put in more money or whatever to try and make it work. Okay. Thank you. So would it be possible to restructure the agreement such that we contribute three million dollars up to the amount of the initial um, or the accepted bid, but nothing beyond that? So, so I, what I'm looking at is protecting ourselves from being on the hook for overruns at the same time giving the giving WashDOT flexibility to accept a larger bid. So let's just say that bids came in at a million and a half more than the available WashDOT funding. And so then we would uh, contribute $1.5 million so that they could move forward with that deal. So we could cap it at something like $3 million, but limit our exposure to whatever the initial bids came in at. Does that make sense? I believe I understand what you're asking, and I'd say the likelihood of being able to do that is low. Uh, the reason being is, is because the, the piling for the wall where the constrained area is, is deeper than what they would have done otherwise. And so where they may need most of the contingency may be under our wall. Uh, and so to 
try and reduce or restrict how much we're going to contribute based upon the actual bid. Uh, there's other costs involved there and other risk involved that WashDOT's probably not willing to take. Mm. It just seems to me that they're asking for this additional funding given that they're concerned that the bids will come in above engineering estimates. And if we came back and said, we're, we're with you on that, and we will, we will support you up to the bid price, but they should have contingencies in place um, that are um, reflective of what they ass assess as the risk of building this project. And so um, I'm, I'm good to help them get to a point of um, getting a, a viable bid. I, I just have a little bit of trouble signing up for risk that I think they should have already factored into their, their plans. So the Connecting Washington projects have a very specific budget associated with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, the amount of contingency that they have available above the construction contract number of 50.5, as shown in the exhibits to the agreement, is roughly 4%. So that's probably just a little bit under $3 million uh, for the entire project. They're constructing a wall with additional costs to the project on behalf of the city on the order of $6 million. If they weren't building what we have requested, they would have an additional $6 million in contingency. We've asked them to use their contingency for our benefit. And they're asking in return $3 million that they would be able to use uh, to increase the available funding for bidding as well as, if needed, to help reestablish some of the contingency that they've lost. I, I'm not sure I, I agree with that. I think they probably built their contingency on the whole $50.5 million of, of construction. Um, that, and if they didn't, they should have. Um, so whether or not, I, I think since they agreed to do the $6 million before we had this discussion, which Confirm that that's the case, that when we originally went forward with this, when this was put together, WashDOT agreed to build the retaining wall um, just as they were doing this project. Is that, is that, am I correct on that or am I mis misunderstanding? Before they had their engineer's estimate, they had verbally said that they were willing to put it into the project. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I, I would just think, from my perspective, they should have been building that contingency around, around that. So I don't think it's fair for us to say, you know, we're, we're somehow causing them to not have contingency. They, sh they should, you know, and we don't know where this is going to come into, and you know, I could even be okay with saying we could go over and above to say a quarter of a million dollars, which would be about four percent of the six hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, that is, you know, we'll 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 match a consistent uh, contingency equal to our 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 cost. But to me, for us to have a have this kind of covering their contingency just doesn't seem right to me. And that, that's where I'm binding up on this thing. Um, Sheldon, could you explain Connecting Washington then? This project had a, a conceptual scope and an approved dollar value, and none of that, and that was done before we approached them and asked them to include our yes. retaining model? Yes, everything had gone through the state legislature before the city asked anything of WashDOT. And before they did a detailed engineer's estimate where they did include an element for us, now, which is the $6 million retaining wall. Correct. Okay. So I think, I think I, I might be hearing you wrong, but I think what you're saying is they should have built it into their Connecting Washington. I think the answer I'm hearing is they did. And then we said, when you scope it out, can you add in an element for us? And they said yes. I'm not sure that's what I heard, but OK. Oh, OK. Uh, Councilmember Winterstein. I do have something to contrib contribute to that point. Actually, what the legislature approved was shoulder hardening. Mm -hmm. That's and correct. And when that project uh, showed to not have the benefit that they had forecasted, they said, go back and re-envision the project. And that's when it turned into auxiliary lanes. So the, fun but the funding never changed. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, my read on this is, was that reworking from short of hardening to um, auxiliary lanes within, without a changing budget is one of the reasons they are feeling a contingency pinch. That's my two cents. That, that was super helpful. Thank you. I also think or hope it's apparently clear that 
when you make the commitment, if you make the commitment this evening, that based on construction projects and how big contingencies should be, there's a very high chance this will get used, mm -hmm. in part or in all. You may, and not that I come back and say, are you all okay that we're leasing the $3 million? I think there's a chance. That's, that's the realistic risk that you guys are evaluating tonight. Because it is, seems to be yeah. part of a contingency bucket, and they tend to get used. So, do we need more uh, more questions or deliberations? Because I, uh, whenever you, okay, question, go ahead, Vicki. Is it, would it be possible to have the contingency on our part of the project? It, it actually, to me, it reads like it is, but I, from listening to the presentation, it sounds like it could be used to cover overages on other parts of the project other than the retaining wall. It can be used for other parts of the project. Would it be possible to have the agreement specify that this would be for the project. WashDOT the won't go for that. We've had that conversation with WashDOT, and their perspective has been, again, it's, you know, if they're building the wall first and they give, and for an additional $6 million that they would not have had to spend otherwise, and then they run into problems later in the project, they're going to need the money. Otherwise, they're going to be cutting other important pieces of the project that were specifically outlined in the state legislature for funding. So. It's Member Goodman. Sheldon, is it fair of me to, is this a fair statement that um, WashDOT is asking us to potentially probably pay up to half um, of the wall that they wouldn't they is and was not otherwise included, that they agreed to build it, and they would like us to contribute potentially up to half. That's exactly correct. 50 cents on the dollar. Other questions? Are you ready to talk this through? Okay, that doesn't mean we can't have more questions that come up during deliberations, but who would like to start? We need a, we need a motion. There's no motion. Well, there's not. I'll start by making a motion. <laughs> um, I, give me just one second. I had it in front of me in the, no, it's, okay. Um, <laughs> I would like to move to authorize the mayor to enter into and execute the interagency agreement with the Washington State Department of Transportation, obliging the city to pay up to $3 million towards the Washington State Department of Transportation connecting Washington I-90 auxiliary lane project. Second. Second. <laughs> Moved and multiple seconded. Uh, discussion. Who would like to start? Councilmember Winterstein? Thank you. A lot of good questioning. I think this is what our council does, really try to understand things. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact it's absolutely stunning that we're even having this conversation, honestly. Um, it was simply, you know, the right question at the right time a number of years ago. I know, Sheldon, that you had even brought it up. And the fact when it was raised with WashDOT, hey, you're gonna be there with your shovels anyway. You know you could help us a little bit. The fact that they listened to that and then took this action and went as far as they did, I think is phenomenal. I saw leadership both from the electeds in Olympia and from the department itself that saw, hey, you know, we're, we're gonna help you out this way. We're really glad that you brought this up to us. So I, I'm, it is actually amazing that this option actually exists because uh, I share the sentiment from comments earlier that, that was mentioned earlier this evening. It, I do really feel like it's now or never. I, I really do feel that this is a now or never thing because the alternatives, just it, nothing gets any cheaper. Uh, and, and, and so I'm hopeful that there are no big rocks where they wanna put a piling uh, and that they don't even have to use their contingency uh, and that, um, that we don't have to really fork over any additional funds. You know, the amount for us would be zero. I'm hopeful that'll be the case. Um, something could happen and they may need this extra contingency and we may pay up to $3 million to help them with that. Um, um, my intended support for this is that, well, I really wish we didn't have to do this, but our citizens and what they need and what they ask for is worth it. Um, I want this as well. I think there's some really good comments that have been made. Uh, you know, you can never engineering and en never engineer a zero um, risk corridor where there's mixed uses. You can't do it. Mm -hmm. But what the but 
this is just one step in a vision to create uh, something new where it will give an opportunity for uh, uh, others who um, can't or won't use that corridor for non-motorized reasons today for very good reasons. And, and, and that's, what we're, that's what we're doing. We're, we're creating an opportunity uh, to help others you know, live the lifestyle, the kind of lifestyle that they, they desire for themselves and their family, and even as we heard for future generations. So, so I mean, all of those motivations are here. Um, I think another key thing that's playing into my uh, decision as well, it's secondary to all of those reasons, um, is that when Kathy George from the Washdot was here and spoke to us and we talked about, hey, if you had to refactor the project, she was very clear. Oh, by the way, that sound wall would be the first one to go. She was very, very clear. That sound wall goes, no retaining wall, no project down here. So we have to refactor. It's not going to happen for you. Uh, that was unfortunate um, to hear that, uh, and and um, so the risk um, I, I, that we haven't kind of talked about that. We talked about maybe them coming back and talking with us, but Kathy was pretty clear about that. Uh, about that would be the f first wall to go. So um, uh, for all of those reasons and others, but uh, the, the, you know this is. Uh, a project that's going to take multiple phases. We haven't even talked about our form of the project and how we're going to fund that and what that is. We're going to have future conversations, uh, hopefully, very soon about that. Uh, but this is a necessary step. Um, and I, I really do think for what we need to do in this area, that this is a now or never time. And I want to, I'm willing to use our city resources to ensure that we get to move forward. Thank you. Uh, did I see your hand? Did I see your hand? Okay. Um, I think I saw Deputy Council President Batiste first, and then Goodman, and then Hunt. And remember that it can also be comments to your council members about why they have certain positions as well, if you need to get more information from them. Right. Thank you. This is a project that we've been talking about for years. Uh, I, I remember a three o'clock in the morning conversation uh, on council where we were talking about the fact that WashDOT was coming in and they were going to be working on shoulder hardening and this was an opportunity for us to try to deal with this really important safety and uh, safety issue and being able to take one of uh, our very large <coughs> neighborhoods and, and give them the, um, those, the mobility uh, opportunities for pedestrians and bicyclists and, and really to solve the safety issues. So I just remember all those conversations that we've been having from um, way back when and um, I have to agree with Council Member Winterstein uh, in terms of I, um, the fact that, that they listened, this has progressed. Uh, now it's, it's a really a, a different project and we're here and talking about having to deal with um, the $3 million. But I think that um, if we have to go, if we say no and we have to go back to any kind of repackaging, I, I don't have a lot of faith that we'll, that we'll have this opportunity and, I, and then I feel like it would be a lost opportunity. And this is, this is something that I have heard since my time on council loud and clear uh, from um, community members about this particular stretch of road. Um, so I'm, I'm very much in favor of, of uh, looking at this. I, I, I did have, have a lot of questions and I think that we've done a really good job tonight talking it through, trying to understand the, the, you know, the three million and where that would go. And I do understand that, you know, in construction projects, there are typically overages. And so understanding that that, that, that may be used. Uh, but, I, but I do very much feel that if we, if we try to go back or we go back to repackaging, um, that, that it could be a complete lost opportunity. And I feel like this is um, something critical that uh, these neighborhoods have have asked for and talked about. And I know just uh, as one of seven, I've I've definitely heard this uh, message loud and clear about the safety on that road. I think it's um, the time to act. Thank you, Council Member Goodman. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, supportive. Um, and as my last comment indicated or question, I, I think it's completely fair. Uh, for Washtaw to ask us to pay um, potentially half of the, of the cost of a wall that was not a part of their project. I think they've um, acted in, what I can tell, in good faith and working w with us um, in a, a fairly extraordinary manner. 
and I do not have any confidence that they would feel um, the need to come back to us and repackage with the wall and ask us um, again if we denied it, um, the commitment the first time. Um, and, and I think that an, another, another delay, a uh, year delay, um, just for so many reasons, just is a bad idea. Um, so I'm supportive for those reasons. And of course, the community wants this very badly. Thank you. Councilmember Hunt. I am also in support. I, as was mentioned in public comments, this was a neighborhood that was annexed um, several years ago. And I think this, uh, this connectivity project will be a big step towards actually making this neighborhood feel connected um, with the rest of the city. And this is a physical connection, non-motorized connection for um, those families so that they can access some of the amenities in the city that make Issaquah so special, including the um, Lake Sammamish State Park. Uh, and I think, as has been said, I think it's a very timely opportunity to do this project with the partnership of um, WashDOT, and I think there's a clear public benefit here um, in connecting this neighborhood and in support, and thank you for all of the additional information this evening. Thank you. Councilmember Ray. So I think it is wrong to conflate the idea of providing multi-mode bike and pedestrian um, corridor from um, South Lake Sammamish to the rest of Issaquah with this project. We could, we could have the wall built without giving the $3 million to WashDOT right now. So they are related, but they are not the same. So I think it's not to say, if I support this, I don't support that, or vice versa, because they, they are not related. What we're really talking about here is a $3 million insurance policy. We are gonna commit $3 million to WashDOT um, as insurance that we will get this retaining wall. And we might get the retaining wall without the $3 million, but we believe if we do the $3 million, um, we will get the retaining wall. I have every belief if we commit $3 million, we will get billed for $3 million on, on this project. So I think to the mayor's point, I, I suspect that will happen. And so I am asking myself this question, what could we do with that $3 million um, for the city of Issaquah? I think Steve talked about during public comment, what else are we doing to address some of our traffic concerns? What else are we doing to address some of our, our capital project concerns? So to me, it's not about, yeah, this is a good idea or this is a bad idea. To me, it's a, is this the best use for those $3 million? Because we don't have a lot of those $3 million laying around. So I'm still weighing this. I, I think this is, a, this is a difficult question for me. Thank you for framing it that way. Council President Martz, and then last, we'll do Council Member Walsh. So to, to Council Member Ray's uh, uh, comment, um, you know, this is, uh, when we did ad hoc finance committee, this $3 million was in, was a, was a line item mm -hmm. in the uh, suite of improvements that I think all three of us got to a point where we said we wanted. It's a $3 million we may have to spend or may have to not spend. So um, I, I would cheerfully ask to, to separate how you feel about the bidding process that the Washington State Department of Transportation puts us in, right, where we, we may wind up in, in the end actually when all is said and done paying for something that is something else, to say that as, as a package of improvements that we wanna see as a city, this particular facet I think is generally held to be uh, important and an important use of $3 million. Um, I, I do wanna reiterate to my fellow council members to get where we wanna get with South Cove uh, connectivity to the rest of the city, it's $15 million, right? This is the first step in a longer conversation about how do we get the connectivity that we need uh, that the community has told us is so important. Um, but it is important and I'll be supporting it this evening. Thank you. Council Member Walsh. So I come to this thinking about when we came to Washington and said, hey, this is a great opportunity for us. They didn't say, but the $6 million. They didn't immediately say, great, you want it, you pay for it. They didn't even ask us for 50% at that point. What they ended up asking us was when this project changed from what the state legislature first envisioned it with connecting Washington, um, 
and kind of expanded beyond that. They said, hey, we're at risk of this entire project coming in with bids above the engineer's estimate. And they said, who's on the line for this? Who can we ask to put some money in to make a difference on that? So I really appreciate the methods of that. That actually reminds me quite a bit of the six, Southeast 62nd and Costco putting in so much money on that. Um, so I am in support of this as this funding idea. I look forward to the future conversation about how we might be able to connect those neighborhoods, but I do want to distinguish these things and say this is really about this funding mechanism and our ability to make this project happen. Thank you. Any final comments or are we ready to go to the vote? Not seeing any hands, so I will reread the motion. There's no further discussion. All those in favor of authorizing the mayor to enter into and execute the interagency agreement with the Washington State Department of Transportation, obligating the city to pay up to $3 million towards the wash dot connecting Washington I-90 auxiliary lane project, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. A motion carries uh, six in favor, one opposed. I just want to thank you all. I think the deliberation comments piece of this was super illuminating, um, hopefully to those that are here tonight and those that watched it. You brought up a lot of good information about why this was such a tough and difficult decision. So thank you for that. That was really good. The next item on the agenda is good of the order. And before I go to the council president or myself, we both have multiple items for you. Does anyone else have anything? Council member Winterstein and deputy council president Patisse. Thank you. There's a couple things happening in Olympia that are gonna need to get our attention. And there was a bill passed out of the Senate that's now in front. Um, it's gonna go to the house for consideration one regarding, well, that one out of the Senate was regarding ADUs, the other one, the, ma the mandated minimum density, which our city opposes uh, both of those. Uh, the ADU one does have, will um, give, uh, will grandfather any municipalities existing code regarding ADUs as of where they are as of July of this year. Um, I'm just kind of, if, if that one goes all the way through and passes, then I think I'm going to really ask that the administration and this council work really hard if it, and that's not, it's on top of everything we're already trying to do. Uh, Just for to those who aren't paying attention, that's the two ADUs per single family lot? Yeah, it's also, it doesn't have the ownership requirement. Yes. It removes the ownership yes. requirement. Boy, I tell you, okay. we, have a, we have a good law. Um, we would have to amend that law to maybe counter some points in the, in the state bill. And if we get that done by July, our bill, our law is good they would grandfather our law. So that was just, I just want to give a heads up on that one. Let me um, actually bring Administrator Moon into that. Where are we on our ADU code updates? I thought we dealt with this last year. Did we not do our modifications? Yeah, we did, but there's some provisions in the what passed the Senate that are um, more, that are contradict us, that we may be silent on or not. Okay. We would have to review that. We'd have to be returned. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Council President Patisse. So I, I just have a, um, a thank you and a very timely comment as uh, Council Member Goodman uh, was reporting out about uh, EFER and um, a new program where people are providing information to, to make things easier for first responders. Uh, the other evening I came home, my daughter came home from college, it was midnight and the fire alarm went off in the building. Uh, that I live in. I live in a in a town home and uh, came downstairs and the building was on fire. Oh. Um, and we, uh, we, we had a fire within the building, I should say. And by the time I called 911, by the time I saw the smoke, called 911, the f two fire trucks and two police uh, cars had already arrived. And there were, uh, you know, children and, and dogs and parents, and there were people everywhere. And just watching um, all of the first responders deal with 
such a, a complicated issue um, in such a large uh, complex and figuring out where things were and making sure everyone was safe was just amazing to watch. And so I just really want to, from the bottom of my heart, thank uh, um, Eastside Fire and Rescue and our police department for everything that they did and such a fabulously um, amazing response. And just being able to watch everyone in action was, uh, was great. We, we live in a, a wonderful place and um, I'm very thankful and I know everyone that, that lives near me was as well. Thank you for sharing that. Councilmember Ray. So, Councilmember Batiste, you should go to Firefighting 101 here <laughs> in know. April and, and see know. what it's like on the other side of the map. <laughs> right. That's right. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to move to Council President Martz, who's brought a couple of items along for you. Oh, Councilmember. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned this earlier. We heard a little bit. I thought it was really good comments about the whole the salmon predation and all that. There is an event this Wednesday. Uh, evening, I, and I, it's at the um, Issaquah Brew House. I think it's six o'clock ish, about. And and where a it, uh, last time they did this, there was a state wildlife biologist who who was I think, or maybe a federal biologist who was furloughed at the moment. During and that, uh, very informative, very helpful for the neighborhood, uh, for the community, uh, and, and to learn a little bit more about the science about what might be happening in Lake Sammamish. Um, I plan on attending, and I think it's a, a really good event. It is mentioned in our own. It is, it is Wednesday, it is at starting at 6.30. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Council President Martz, you have several things you would like to Several, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll try to get through them expeditiously. A uh, couple of things that came out of PIC where I was asked, where all of us at PIC were asked specifically to go back to our councils and uh, get uh, some feedback as to what we should do. One is on affordable housing. Uh, PIC voted unanimously to bring back for consideration to the next PIC meeting a position of support for the Challenge Seattle initiative on the, in, on the invisible crisis of the lack of affordable middle income housing. You might also know this is the Microsoft initiative <laughs> because they're one of the people who got involved uh, and sort of um, uh, kicked this into uh, higher gear. There are seven elements uh, that would be general recommendations. It's super important to realize that this recommendation would not be that every city needs to adopt all seven of these, but that these seven would be uh, valuable for cities to consider. They are, by a remarkable circumstance, the exact same seven recommendations that our city has already signed on to broadly recommend as part of the mayor's signing on to the original letter that went out on this subject. Uh, however, not all cities uh, are as uh, forward-thinking as ours, and so not everybody signed on to that letter, and so this is why uh, this is something that PIC uh, isn't a slam dunk for PIC, so I wanted to uh, check with all of you that this action by PIC, which again would mirror what we've already done uh, along with a suite of other mayors, uh, is something that I would have your support to recommend in favor of to PIC. Does anybody need us to run through the points? Council President Martz did send them ahead of time, but we can do a quick little run through. That's good. I have a question. Um, so PIC next meets when? Uh, April something, uh, the second Wednesday in April. And so our next council meeting is April one. Our regular. It's council before meeting? that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to. I wanted to use this opportunity this evening because we had a lighter agenda. So I thought. We had a what agenda? Lighter. A lighter. A lighter I thought, agenda. I thought you said letter. Lighter like, agenda. No. Um, so and so I do. I appreciate that. Um, um, we got this though the information at quarter to four and I was in meetings all the way until almost six o'clock. And so um, if um, if other council members are interested, we could have a like an introduction to this tonight and then come back with substantive comments. I just haven't had a chance to consider if you, it. If you would prefer, that's totally fine. Um, and I'll do that with the other item. I'll just tee it up and we'll come back and talk about it at the next council meeting. We certainly have the time to do that. Okay. So. Other questions before you go off to mull this one mm -hmm. over? Okay, so I'll introduce. That. That's great. I'll introduce the other one, which I would say is is probably more contentious, which is um, Pick is considering taking a position on I nine seventy six, mm -hmm. which is the latest I'm in initiative. Uh, the initiative would impact state and local funding sources, TBDs. It would repeal ability to impose any vehicle license fees, including voter approved license fees. Uh, it would, uh, for sound transit, it would repeal ability to impose a motor vehicle excise tax, MVET. 
Um, so uh, it's anticipated the punchline, and since everybody's going to go take a look at this offline, I, I, won't, I won't go into it too far. But uh, it is expected to have a uh, profound impact on Sound Transit's funding if it goes through. Um, w with ourselves as the last major project on the Sound Transit 3 uh, uh, menu, uh, it could potentially impact us. PIC does not normally take positions on issues like this. Um, but a number of cities would like PIC to consider doing it because the nature would be so profound uh, to sound transit. That's Member Goodman. Um, thanks, Tola. The, um, the information from um, Deanna specifically asks us, please discuss or says, please discuss with your council and staff how this initiative may impact your city. So um, is it possible to um, at some time before the next meeting, get some information about how this might affect our city. The administrator Moon, is this one of the ones that um, we might already have some of this from our lobbyists and others to share? Yeah, we've had some okay. dialogue already. Okay. There certainly would be an impact both to us um, in our current state and sort of where we might go on our transportation benefit district. So okay. significant impact, and it, it would be nice to know specifically what that yep. impact is impacts are. So that would be a response then from Jean or our lobbyist back or you, you, okay. Great. Okay. And then the last, so do you have a question? And then the last thing that I have is just a heads up um, that uh, I have, so, so we, we don't, um, all that often um, make move things from the council side that don't start off on the staff side, but um, you get a couple of co uh, co sponsors and we can move things. Um, I have asked with the, the support of Council Deputy President Batiste and Council Member Walsh, um, asked the administration to draft an anti discrimination uh, resolution. And we had uh, been talking about this when the uh, graffiti incidents happened in Kalahani. And of course, uh, with the horrors uh, that occurred in New Zealand last week in Christchurch, uh, of which is a sister city to Seattle, so has a, has a connection here, and has so profoundly impacted uh, Muslim folks around the world, uh, seemed like a, a good time to consider uh, doing something like that. So we don't have language today because we just started the conversation on Friday. Um, there's a draft, but it, I didn't want to put it in front of everybody today, but uh, it will be ready in time for us to consider uh, at the next full council meeting. So I just wanted to give you a heads up to look for that uh, incoming. And we, and we can take comments on it tonight too. If you have specific things you want to make sure are added in as language, typically the Proclamations that I do do come from the staff side or from an external request of a nonprofit or an agency for us to do one. This really is coming from you and should be your voice. So it'll be interesting to see your thoughts on the draft and discuss it at the next meeting. Okay, I have a couple more items if there's no questions on that one. Um, one question. Oh, I'm sorry. When would the draft come out so we'd be able to read it and have time to make substantive comments if necessary? I believe we could have that out to you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Although I, I think I still, uh, you and I, email. I want to iterate a little bit. Certainly this week, right? Sure, that's that's fine. That's fine. Uh, we can turn it around quickly, I think, is the bottom line on that. Thanks. Um, so we had some guests tonight from FISH asking the council if they wanted to um, correspond with the legislature on HB 1579. Uh, and I wanted to check in with you on that and get some direction from you on what you would like me to do. They can provide me and uh, they, they have sent letters with information that I can form a letter on behalf of the mayor's office, on behalf of the mayor and city council. So I just wanted to get your direction on what you thought about that presentation, what you'd like me to do. Uh, let's go to Walsh, Hunt, and then Goodman. Uh, it was my understanding that HB 1579 did not pass the house and thus isn't something that would be supported. I believe that was what he had said. Mm. Yes. Do you know more, Emily? I do. There's, uh, I'm trying to look it up real quick. There's been at least one substitute bill, I think two substitute bills out of the house. It went through house committee. Um, there's 
now, you know, uh, the, the version going through the Senate, um, we have yet to see how it might be modified or if there will be another substitute bill from the Senate okay. side. I guess my question was still just, we still need to do it. Yeah, <laughs> and more, if there isn't a bill there that is available to support, what other methods might we have to help with this? Because it sounded like there was, one was a support of a bill and the other was just some support of one of the wildlife or Department of Natural Resource funding areas that might provide help in this area. Either way, I support the idea. Um, I just think we should probably figure out exactly what that is. Madam Mayor. Yep. Go ahead. Just to clarify, I think uh, you are correct that what you heard from fish folks is they are looking for sort of broader support for recovery efforts. Um, and this particular bill implements some of those strategies, would potentially implement some of those strategies. So uh, they have near term desire for us to support that bill and to convey our broader support as well uh, to legislators and our lobbyists. Um, I suspect they will also then follow up um, subsequent to this session and ask for um, additional types of support from the city. Thoughts on a letter of support? Maybe not for a particular bill, but just something down to the state legislature on, and we did hear from some members of the public this evening too about salmon recovery. What's next? Councilmember Hunt was next. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, Councilmember Hunt and then Councilmember Winterstein. Okay. Um, so, as I had mentioned in my regional report, um, as the representative on the Salmon, Re Salmon Recovery Council for Waira 8, Water Resource Inventory Area 8, um, the position of Waira 8 is to support this. I think it has gone through some iterations, as um, City Administrator Moon spoke about, and there is some concern that about it not being as effective um, over the process of getting changes made going through the legislature. But uh, I spoke to Jason Mulvihill Kuntz, who's the salmon recovery manager earlier today, and the position is that this is not the whole solution, but it is a step in the right direction. So, um, as, so hopefully this bill can be strengthened, more bills can follow, but um, that is the position of Wire 8, and Issaquah as a member of um, why we're eight, I think we should be supportive of that. Uh, and then also, if, if council members are interested, um, I was also provided with this letter that um, the Salmon Recovery Council had sent to the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. It, it goes through all of the different studies about predation of salmon that are necessary, all of the different aspects of predation that are believed to be important in, as far as managing salmon for both orca recovery as well as salmon recovery. And um, as was mentioned in public comment, this is something that's iconic to our city. It's very important, and it's also very important specifically because we have the salmon hatchery. So we as a city are particularly invested in making sure that our salmon hatchery, salmon, um, survive and contribute. So contribute to the salmon recovery. So I am in support. There is some question about what the final substitute bill will be, I think, and I think that that was part of the comments that were made earlier, and also that this is not the last step and that cities right. and the legislature will have to go further, but um, I think this is a step in the right direction, so I am in you support. You would like something written. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Winterstein. Plus one, okay. and it did pass the House and it's got a hearing in the Senate tomorrow. So what I'm hearing is that I should get some information from Councilmember Hunt's Wire 8. Um, I should work with the communications team and I should draft something to the state legislature in support of th this bill, but also just broader in support, maybe pulling on some of the themes that Wire 8 had about, and, and then some specific comments about Issaquah and our unique situation. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Am I understanding that correctly? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I think it's... Oh. oh, sorry, Councilmember Ray. Let me just talk and then I'll get sure. right afterwards. Um, just a, a quick look at, at um, House Bill 1579. It's really about killer whales and, and salmon is a, it's a tangential issue. You know, it's a food source. Um, what I think I heard was something much broader than that about, uh, or much more specific than that. So I am okay with supporting something around 1579, but I think the broader issue is uh, around um, Salmon recovery, salmon predation, salmon habitat. 
Awesome. Any other comments? Member Goodman? Um, I guess just one, um, you know, as we talk, start talking about these House bills and their numbers, um, I'm not necessarily tracking them. So um, if we just start sort of start talking about whether we support something, it's really difficult for me to figure out just, you know, like Council Member Ray brought up, oh, it's really about, you know, other, other um, points in there. So I would just request that we have a little bit more of a runway and we have a little bit more information um, when we're um, being asked to discuss something in good of the order and provide feedback in some direction. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise, I don't feel like I am yeah. talking with any authority or knowledge on the subject. So I can, um, when I send out a draft for review, include more information on the specific House bill as well, because it'll probably be referenced in the letter to some degree. Other comments? Yeah, the last thing I had on here, and it's come out of um, hearing it in several different places, is on the draft environmental impact statement on the Vision 2050, and we have a representative who sits on GMPB, and this uh, particular um, subject is so important, it's probably going to hit a bunch of different representatives on a bunch of different regional committees we, that we sit on. I had talked with our Director of Development Services and Planning a few months ago about how to bring those decision-making points, those public input comment points to you and what you would like to do. So it's, this is just me asking you for some feedback on, I heard one suggestion that we should have somebody from PSRC come and do a presentation for you. Um, we could have a staff person who is familiar and tracking this do a presentation and then there's an input period and, uh, of time, and I think Issaquah, where we are and how we've done our own planning has sort of, should have some good comments and good feedback on this, and I'd like to get that input from you. I just want to know how you want to do that. What are you expecting? What are your preferences? Member Walsh? I think that's a fabulous idea. I was going to go in and type out and my own, but I don't think that has the same impact. And so maybe a first question would be back to PSRC, which is, do they have a method or an expectation of a city's response to that? Um, and if not, why not? Um, but yes, in general, I, I think I would support either a presentation or just it coming up generally and us having a response. Um, okay, and the reason, one of the reasons I'm bringing it up is that on the Transportation Policy Board, when we did the long-range transportation plan that we talked about, is they do uh, solicit uh, comments directly from the community, and I saw them because I'm on the TPB, and that's where I saw comments from residents in Issaquah and Miramont and all the rest. And I thought, wow, if you're not in a chair, <laughs> this stuff would pass you right by. So I wondered, is is it important to you to hear from your own community versus just having Puget Sound Regional Council collect the information? Is this something that you think a public hearing would generate information of benefit to you? Yeah. Councilmember Goodman. Absolutely. I didn't know that there was an opportunity for us to see what um, folks in our community were saying. Um, if there's an opportunity for this, yes. And if uh, PSRC wants to come with a dog and pony show, absolutely. Okay. And I, I'm not answered. really sure what's possible right now, but I'm just taking any comments or suggestions that you have. Council President Martz. Yeah, I just want to point out that um, SCA is encouraging cities to respond to the draft uh, SEIS, so definitely they see value in a city response. Um, the SA, SE, Dra draft SEIS comment period will run through April 29th, yeah. so we certainly have some time yeah. to yeah. Uh, get some uh, additional public uh, input uh, now and then. Okay. And what you think that would look like might be hosting your own at a council meeting? Um, me asking PSRC for any 98027 comments? What do you, how do you, what do you see that looking like? I don't know how they collect them and how they, so I don't know what's available, but. Email? Huh? I believe it's mostly email. I haven't followed the link myself, this one. I guess anything in our area that, um, like I would trust the administration 
staff to figure out what could be collected, what's relevant for us. Any other thoughts? I mean, I, I would I would think broadly speaking, um, some sort of introduction to the subject, uh, an overview from staff, time for the public to take a look at it, us taking whether it's a public hearing, I don't know. I, I, again, I, I also trust the staff on how to do that. Okay. But in the end, what I what I think we'd like to what I would think would probably be most valuable as a city is we sort of uh, collate what the key pieces of feedback would be. Um, because I, I don't think what we want, I mean, the nightmare would be a 50-point laundry list, right? I think um, it would be more powerful to have a few specific things that we feel are the strongest pieces of feedback that we as a city would have. Okay. Thank, Thank you. That's helpful. I feel just the opposite. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I don't particularly, if it's 50, um, I mean, if it's 5,000, that's one thing, but I don't want to. I think there needs to be a judgment call when we find out what that volume of feedback looks feedback looks like. But I don't I don't personally feel like I want to send the message right now that I just wanted a couple or a few powerful messages. I I would kind of like to see what the community said what the community feedback is, get a sense of it. I don't know what the pile looks like. It's member Walsh. Um, just as far as our city's <laughs> general <laughs> feedback, um, I don't know what the Planning Policy Commission's workload looks like right now, but this seems like a long-term vision for the region, which might belong in that area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other suggestions? Anything else I can help you to give to you on this conversation ahead to help you with it or I go back with Emily, we, we look at the, what the possibilities are. Um, I don't think there is an enormous bandwidth to add a project onto the work plan. However, we're being asked for our opinion, we should give it, so there'll be something. I'm not sure what it'll look like. Um, anything else I can do to help you before that? There is a link on our website, but I believe it takes you right to the PSRC website. We're not directly collecting information. PSRC is. Okay. Great, that was it, thank you, that was super helpful. Um, I did wanna do a look ahead at the April 1st council meeting. Uh, the potential agenda items for that meeting right now include amending IMC 18.22, wireless communication facilities and related fees. And I don't have any other, other items right now. Uh, there is no executive session after this meeting. We had one prior to this meeting, and so there being no further business, the meeting is adjourned at 9.28.